Live from WRAL News Headquarters in Raleigh, your number one source for local news. WRAL News, coverage you can count on. And the power of a wind shift, we just went from steamy to comfy. I'll explain why and how long it'll feel much nicer. A child in Fayetteville was seriously hurt after bullets fly through a home in a drive-by shooting. A neighbor recalls the moments that gunfire rang out as police searched for the shooter. And day five of Hunter Biden's federal gun charges trial is underway. What's expected to happen today after the trial reached a critical point in testimony? Good afternoon to you. I'm Jeff Hogan on this Friday. Thanks for joining us. The search is on in Fayetteville for a suspect in a drive-by shooting that sent a child to the hospital. This happened just after midnight at a home on Danish Drive. WRL's Gilbert Bays spoke with a neighbor who heard those shots in the night. Gilbert. Yeah, Jeff, a frightening situation for a lot of folks who live out here in this community. This is the home that was uh, shot up last night. Uh, this community is just off Yakin Road, right near the Yakin Road um, gate that, enter, uh, that you get into uh, Fort Liberty to. So this is very close to the military installation. Now, there are some bullet holes in this house here, but there's also some windows shot out over there as well. We're not sure if the, these, this is all connected or if that house was abandoned and maybe those windows might be broken. Let me show you what it looked like this morning when police got here. This was a scene early this morning. Fayetteville police responding to a call that shots were fired in this community. And this is what they found when they got on scene just after midnight. There are bullet holes in at least two locations inside this house. As you mentioned, I talked with a neighbor who said he saw a car driving slowly up and down the street. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he heard multiple gunshots. I waited a few minutes, heard the cops pull up, taped everything off. Uh, the mother was outside, of course, hysteric. And I heard her say that her baby got shot in the face. She was saying that people uh, drove by and shot up in the house. Again, the bullet holes in this house tell the story. Uh, this had to be a frightening situation. Right now, we're trying to, to confirm how many people were inside the house and if anyone else was shot. Police are also trying to determine a motive for this shooting. We're uh, reaching out to Fayetteville Police to try to get an update on the child that was shot. And uh, right now, again, an ongoing in, uh, investigation. Anyone with information about what happened out here early this morning is asked to contact Fayetteville Police. Reporting live here in Fayetteville, Gilbert Bays, WRAL News. Last night's front is pushing off our coast. It will help deliver a more comfortable air mass for the part of the weekend. Meteorologist Elizabeth Gardner is in the WRL Severe Weather Center right now, and that humidity has already started dropping a little bit. It was amazing. We just saw our wind shift, and the temperature uh, is still warm, but the humidity dropped considerably, or at least the dew point did, just in the last hour or so. This is a live look at Franklinton. Looks beautiful out there. We're seeing plenty of sunshine, uh, people out and about, and a fairly comfortable temperature right now. 84 will likely climb on up to around 88. Our wind is west-southwest at 7 miles per hour, and as we get more of that, west northwest flow coming in we will continue to see that number falling right now we're looking at a high of 89 so again it's going to be a warm afternoon there's that front notice on this side of the front on the east side of it that flow is coming out of the south well this whole thing has shifted to the coast so we had a southerly flow yesterday and it was just uncomfortably warm uh, and muggy so here's what's going to happen overnight tonight and into the day saturday we have that wind coming out of the northwest and you can notice that the arrows are shaded in blue and yellow to show the cooler temperatures. Now, behind that, we have more of a flow on the other side of the mountains coming out of the south, and we'll see that for Sunday. So Saturday is going to feel comfortable. Sunday is going to feel a little bit uh, more steamy, if you will. So the dew point dropped to 58. That puts us in the comfy zone. We'll likely stay there tonight through the day tomorrow, and then we're going to see it climbing back up to steamy, almost tropical, with another drop on Monday. And we'll talk more about why we're seeing those big drops coming up. But this is the way it'll look for the weekend tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll see a high of 88, so it will still be hot, but we'll keep that low humidity, making it feel more comfortable. Sunday, it's hotter and more humid with a high of 93, and we may see a few isolated storms. I'll show you what time to expect those coming up. All right, thanks, Elizabeth. We'll check back. A passenger car struck the front end of a dump truck at an Exxon gas station on Falls of Noose Road. Video from Sky 5 shows that accident between the silver car there and that dump truck. There was no effect to traffic. It happened in the parking lot, and it's not clear if anyone was injured. Chapel Hill police are looking for a hit and run suspect. This is Brianna Beasley. Police say yesterday morning she hit a cyclist at the intersection of Franklin Street and Keenan Street. Officers say she initially stopped, then left before giving any information. The cyclist was taken to the hospital and is expected to recover. 
Beasley drives a black Honda Pilot with North Carolina plates TFL 4785. If you know where she is, give Chapel Hill Police a call. There is a warrant out for her arrest on a felony hit and run charge. Today, White House officials are making a stop in Raleigh. President Biden's senior advisor Tom Perez is visiting the city to meet with two with tour pro, two projects that funded through the American Rescue Plan Act. Right now, he is touring Healing Transitions after its renovation to classrooms. Megan Anderson says the federal funds are helping the city launch more programs to help more people. We're doing a lot of pilots right now to uh, break down a lot of barriers for clean transportation and clean energy. It's not easy to figure out, but, but with these pilots and thanks to a lot of the funding that we've received from the federal government, we've really been able to learn a lot. So I think over time we're going to be able to do more and more to bring access to more people. Perez also made stops at Wake Med Center for Community Health and studios at 2800 and affordable housing development. I'm Chris Lovingood in the WRL Life Center. In the last hour and a half, we heard from President Joe Biden as he was speaking at the site of D-Day overseas in France. And he spoke a little bit about democracy. That was really the central theme of his discussion. And at one point in his speech, he was also likening uh, the, the soldiers who have died uh, during World War II, and he likened their spirit sort of to what is happening in today's society. Let me let you listen to what he said. Two more witnesses for the prosecution expected today in Hunter Biden's felony gun. Had some issues there with that audio, but essentially the president said that he wanted to know if today that we think that the soldiers who died during World War II would want us to sit back and not stand up against Vladimir Putin during his war in Ukraine. So I thought that was pretty critical to mention there, but it was a speech that a lot of people are talking about right now, a lot of uh, articles being written, but that is the key point that I took away from listening to that speech. A lot of folks calling it very powerful. The prosecution in Hunter Biden's trial is expected to rest its case after, to, after calling two additional witnesses today. Alice Barr explains this comes after key witness Hallie Biden took the witness stand and gave emotional testimony. Two more witnesses for the prosecution expected today in Hunter Biden's felony gun trial, following deeply personal testimony from the widow of Hunter's brother, Bo, about what she knew of Hunter's drug use and the gun he bought in 2018 during their romantic relationship after Bo died from cancer. Hallie Biden testified she found the gun in Hunter's car. Prosecutors allege he bought it after lying on a federal background check by claiming he was not an active drug user. Worried for Hunter and for her kids, Hallie testified she threw the gun in a trash can outside a grocery store, shown in this video footage. Prosecutors showed the jury a text message from two days after the gun purchase, in which Hunter told Hallie, I was sleeping on a car smoking crack. Hallie, who acknowledged her own past drug use that she's embarrassed and ashamed of, conceded on cross-examination that she never physically saw Hunter use drugs during the time he bought the gun. The defense arguing he did not knowingly lie on the background check. It's true that he had a problem. It's true that he was addicted. The question is, his intent when he filled out that form. President Biden has said he loves and stands by his son, but won't comment on the trial, telling ABC News in a new interview he will accept the jury's verdict, no matter what. Yes. And have you ruled out a pardon for your son? Yes. Turbulent testimony during a critical time in the president's re-election campaign. That was Alice Barr reporting. Hunter Biden's legal troubles are far from over. He faces a separate trial on federal tax charges in September. It is a big weekend for Wake County Public School System as hundreds of high school seniors will receive their diplomas. The festivities are already underway. Yesterday, seniors who attended Salem Elementary School walked the halls with those current young students as they cheered them on. Today, Cary, Roseville, Rollsville, and Enloe High Schools will have their graduations at the Raleigh Convention Center. It'll be full of families and friends throughout the weekend. Lots of downtown traffic celebrating those new grads. The U.S. job market saw 272,000 jobs added in May. That's significantly more than the 180,000 economists expected. 
The bulk of May's job gains were in service providing industries like health care and social assistance. Those industries saw over 83,000 new jobs. Through May, the U.S. economy has added an average of nearly 248,000 jobs per month. That's roughly in line with the strong job growth seen last year. Happening now, soccer matches for women are kicking off at the soccer tournament. It's happening at Wake Med Soccer Park. First year, women are playing in the tournament. Former U.S. women's national team players have formed their own squad and have plans to win that $1 million top prize. Former UNC Tar Heel and NC Courage player Heather O'Reilly is motivated to win on the same field where she won collegiately and professionally. I just had a lot of pride that like this venue was selected and I know they did their research, right? They, um, they obviously, you know, scoured the country looking for, you know, a good facility to do it at. And obviously the town of Cary and, um, NCFC and everybody is collaborating because they see the benefit of this, the value that it can bring everybody. O'Reilly and the U S women are playing right now against Streetball Canada. Next at noon, some of the charges have been dropped against Paul Pelosi's attacker. Why David DePape won't face three of the eight charges he faces in California. Also, major companies involved in artificial intelligence growth are under a federal investigation. The deal in question the government wants to review. Plus, a new FCC multi-million dollar program to determine how schools and libraries could be compromised by cybersecurity threats. Keep watching WRAL News over the air channel 34 and Spectrum channel 1257. Welcome back this noon. The White House is beefing up security ahead of pro-Palestinian demonstrations planned for Saturday. Secret Service put up temporary fencing that blocks access to the White House gates around Pennsylvania Avenue. The agency is anticipating up to 12,000 people to show up to protest the Biden administration's support for Israel in Gaza. A California judge has dismissed a few of the charges against Paul Pelosi's attacker. Three of the eight charges against David DePape were dropped. Those included attempted murder, assault of an elder, and assault with a deadly weapon. Last month, DePape was sentenced in federal court for the 2022 attack at Pelosi's home in San Francisco. In the motion to get the state charges dropped, DePate's defense team argued he should not be charged twice for the crime. The trial is scheduled to resume. In Money Matters today, Elon Musk's space company hit some new milestones, and there's plenty of ways to get a free sweet treat in honor of National Donut Day. Here's more of today's business headlines with Maribel Aver. A big win for SpaceX yesterday. Elon Musk's space exploration company successfully completed a test flight of its Starship rocket for the first time. After launching the mammoth rocket, SpaceX successfully guided the vehicle's spacecraft back into the Earth's atmosphere and to a controlled splashdown in the Indian Ocean. It also brought the vehicle's booster rocket to a soft splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. Both milestones are key to the company's plans to be able to launch and land the Starship on a regular basis. The FDA has reversed its marketing ban on June dual e-cigarettes. The agency had ordered the company to stop selling the products in 2022, but the e-cigarettes stayed on store shelves while that was appealed. Now the FDA says it will review new court decisions and consider updated information from Juul. The agency said it hasn't decided yet on whether the products will ultimately stay on the market. You can now have your Starbucks delivered right to your door. The coffee giant is partnering with Grubhub to deliver its food and drinks. You can order Starbucks through Grubhub's app or online, and you'll be able to customize Customize the orders as you would at a Starbucks location. The service is rolling out in select markets uh, this month and is expected to be available nationwide by August. Plenty of deals and offers to mark National Donut Day today. You can get a free classic donut at Dunkin' when you buy a drink. And at Krispy Kreme, they're going to give you a free donut even if you don't buy anything. Tim Horton, Sheets, Duck Donuts, and other chains also have specials today. The Salvation Army established National Donut Day back in 1938 to honor women who traveled to France to serve snacks and donuts to soldiers in World War I. And those are your business headlines. I'm Maribel Aber at the Nasdaq Market Site. Netflix is facing a multi-million dollar lawsuit for one of its latest hit series. Fiona Harvey claims to be the real-life Martha from the hit miniseries Baby Reindeer. She is suing the streamer for defamation. She says the streamer lied and failed to fact-check the story. Harvey is seeking $170 million in damages. Baby Reindeer tells the story of creator Richard Gadd's stalker. 
Netflix says it intends to defend itself, adding that Gad has a right to tell his story. A popular YouTuber is facing federal charges for a stunt involving fireworks and a helicopter. In a video posted to her channel, Alex Choi is seen shooting fireworks from a helicopter to destroy a Lamborghini. She's charged with placing an explosive device on an aircraft, and she also faces charges for not obtaining the proper film permits. Two people per day die in shootings in our state. Just ahead, how congressional leaders are working to combat the violence. And the U.S. military's temporary pier is now repaired off the coast of Gaza as the U.S. Congress learns when the Israeli prime minister will visit D.C. The mixed response to this news. And here are your winning NC Education Lottery numbers on your screen right now. Shot in 4K ultra high definition, your number one source for local news. WRAL News, coverage you can count on. More money could be coming to the community to combat gun violence. The state is seeing an increase in how many people have died from shootings so far this year. WRAL's data journalist Ali Ingersoll is at the federal courthouse where a meeting with national and local leaders just wrapped up. Ali? Yeah, Jeff, about two North Carolinians have died every single day from gun violence, according to data. That's an increase from this time last year. And it's why leaders are meeting here today, wanting to talk about everything gun related from safe storage, prevention and crime. Congresswoman Deborah Ross led the conversation. She said she's requested additional funding for RPD, the Wake County Sheriff's Office and community organization like Boots on the Ground all of which had leaders at the table today. She also wanted to know about our trends here. Raleigh ranks third behind Charlotte and Durham when it comes to the number of reported shootings so far this year. This is according to data from the Gun Violence Archive. But calls to RPD for shots fired have dropped dramatically, down 67% since peaking in 2021. I credit that just to all the hard work that we're doing as a region, not just the Raleigh Police Department, but in Wake County, really identifying who our problem offenders are, those who are possessing weapons and firearms illegally, and really going after them. For prevention type. Patterson continued to push for responsible gun ownership, saying many of the crimes they see are with stolen weapons. Now, some other people at the table, they talked about statewide policy changes, like repealing the pistol permit requirement that went into effect last year. Since that went into effect and that change happened, we have seen a 9% increase in shootings in the state. In Raleigh, Ellie Ingersoll, WRL News. If you notice more people wearing orange today, it might be related to Gun Violence Awareness Day. Raleigh Police Department posted on social media saying they are taking part today in wearing orange. Their post says they join in the effort to raise awareness to help stop gun violence. Durham County Sheriff's Office arrested a man from the Durham Crime Stoppers Most Wanted list. The arrest of 30-year-old Craig Smith happened just before 2 o'clock this morning at a hotel on NC Highway 55. Deputies say Smith first tried to barricade himself, but later surrendered. He was taken to the hospital and will be transferred to jail. His charges include heroin possession, credit card theft, and fleeing law enforcement. And Jeff, I want to bring our viewers into the WRL Live Center for a breaking update within the past 10 minutes or so. We're hearing from Amazon after this video that we have been showing on our airwaves here about a, a worker, who, a person who is impersonating an Amazon worker who goes up to a package and then takes it away. Put, you see it right there. Puts the package down and then it comes back later and then takes it. Now, Amazon is saying that they are looking into this incident and recognize that, quote, unfortunately, there are bad actors who wear Amazon branded or look alike apparel to commit package theft. Now, they also mentioned that the company actually monitors the Internet regularly for unauthorized Amazon apparel and then demand that those items be removed from sale. So one thing you can do on Amazon's website, it has a link available where you can get more information on how to understand if the person who you see at your door is a legitimate Amazon delivery person. Now to developments related to the Israel-Hamas war. Off the Gaza coast today, a temporary pier built by the U.S. military has been repaired. This pier was designed to develop, deliver humanitarian assistance to Gaza. Rough seas broke apart that pier and caused significant damage to some parts of it. It was repaired and reattached to the beach this morning. Officials expect to resume delivering aid today. So far, things like food, shelter, and medical equipment have been delivered by way of that pier. 
It seems a date has been set for the Israeli Prime Minister's visit to Washington, D.C. for an address before a joint session of Congress. Raf Sanchez is in Tel Aviv with the development and how this news is resonating in our nation's capital. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu will address a joint session of Congress on July 24th. Two sources familiar with the situation tell NBC News. Now, that will be a high profile and potentially very controversial address by the Israeli leader amid his country's ongoing war in Gaza following the October 7th terror attack. A number of Democrats, including Senator Bernie Sanders, have said they will not attend that address. Senator Sanders calling Prime Minister Netanyahu a war criminal, an allegation that the Israeli leader denies. A lot of it will depend on the reality on the ground here in the Middle East by the end of July. If there is a ceasefire in Gaza, it's possible some of the political heat will have gone out of this, but there's possibly also that Israel could be engaged in a full-scale war with Hezbollah, the powerful Iranian-backed militant group in southern Lebanon, by that point in the summer. So we will see what the situation with the war is, but this will be a high-stakes address by the Israeli leader. That uh, acceptance of the invitation coming on the same day that Israel struck a UN school in central Gaza. Israel says it was targeting Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad militants who were hiding inside of that school. But the strike killing at least 40 people, according to hospital officials, more than half of them women and children. Raf Sanchez, NBC News, Tel Aviv. Senator Chuck Schumer issued a statement last night saying he has clear and profound disagreements with the Israeli Prime Minister, but welcomes his speech. Our county-by-county county coverage takes us to Sampson, Johnston, and Orange Counties. Today, a section of I-40 will be dedicated to former state congressman Larry Bell. The stretch from milepost 352 to 357 will be known as Representative Larry M. Bell Highway. Bell was a lifelong resident of Sampson County and served as a county commissioner and school superintendent. His family will meet at Poplar Grove Missionary Baptist Church in Faison today at the top of the hour, 1 o'clock, to celebrate the dedication. Many high school seniors in Johnston County will turn their tassels today. Nine of the county's high schools are holding commencement ceremonies. This is video from last year's ceremonies. The next one starts at 2 p.m. for virtual academy students. Other ceremonies will be at 5, 6, and 7 o'clock this evening. The Teen Center in Chapel Hill reopens tonight. The center, often called The Corner, is a programming collective for middle and high school kids. It gives young people opportunities for creative expression, peer-to-peer -peer connection, and community engagement. The Corner is at the intersection of East Franklin and Henderson Streets. There were tours and games, music, refreshments, and giveaways all planned for tonight's celebration. With less than 50 days to go before the Paris Olympics, a new sport is making its debut. Why one American competing in breakdancing is hoping to change misconceptions. Plus, Vanna White's emotional goodbye to Pat Sajak on his last night as Wheel of Fortune host. Our team is working to bring you exclusive stories. For coverage, you'll find only on WRL. Visit WRL.com and search only. Counting today, 50 days until Summer Olympics kick off in Paris. This year, there is a new sport. Breakdancing is making a debut. All eyes will be on Victor Montalvo. He is the first American to qualify for the games in this sport. The two-time world champ says he's excited and hopes to change the misconceptions about the dance. Breaking is going to get exposed to, like, this broader audience that doesn't know much about breaking and that has misconceptions and stereotypes about the dance. And I'm just so excited to bring the hip hop culture, the breaking culture into the Olympics and just show that, that it's all about peace, love, unity, and having fun. 16 men and 16 women will compete in this sport, which is officially called breaking. Olympic organizers unveiled the iconic display of the five Olympic rings mounted on the Eiffel Tower. Fans can see them from the south side of the Seine River. 
Each ring is made of recycled French steel and is nine meters wide. That's about 30 feet in diameter. This year's medals for both the Olympics and Paralympics will be embedded with pieces of iron, tiny bits of iron taken from the tower. WRL is your home for all things related to the Summer Games. The opening ceremony is July 26th. WRL's Liz McLaughlin will be in Paris with live coverage all throughout the competition. The strong showing from the Boston Celtics taking down the Dallas Mavericks in Game 1 of the NBA Finals last night. Jalen Brown and former Duke star Jason Tatum combined for 38 points, including a dunk by Brown that lots of folks have been replaying. It's coming up right here. Celtics won 107 to 89. And something to keep in mind here, fun fact, 70% of teams that win game one end up winning the world championship. Jeff, we have some breaking news here into the WRL Live Center. What I'm showing you here right now, 475 pages from the FBI into the murder investigation surrounding O.J. Simpson. Now, O.J. died back in April of cancer, you may recall, but this, the 1994 murder of his wife and her friend, this, these documents dive into this a little bit more into detail with it. Again, 475 different documents, ESPN reporting. Again, this, the focus is mainly on the murder investigation of Simpson's wife and her friend. Um, more people are diving through these documents to get more specifics. There's even this image here of a shoe. I uh, don't see the, any image of the glove. You may recall the defense said if the glove does not fit, you cannot, you must acquit. Well, that's one thing I have not seen in these documents. But again, a lot of details being released from the FBI not too long ago. North Carolina Veterans Day Parade may be able to return this November. Coming up, organizers explain how a plan to change the parade rules could help us honor veterans the same year we're marking 80 years since D-Day. Plus, it's almost tea time for the pros in Pinehurst. And the golf course is ready to go. The fan experience, all the extras that you can enjoy, even if you don't have a ticket to go to the tournament coming up. Floats could be allowed in Raleigh parades once again. Floats and other vehicles have not been permitted since 2022 when an 11 year old girl was hit by a truck while dancing in the Raleigh Christmas Parade. If the city signs off on this change, the NC Veterans Day Parade in November could be the first major parade in our area to allow vehicles again. Organizers of that parade are hopeful this will move forward. You may recall last year they canceled the event. There's a lot of our veterans now, we're in our 70s and 80s and, and 90s even. And to walk that, that route from down Fayetteville Street up to the Capitol is just too much for a lot of them. One safety recommendation involves having organizers provide proof of a safety check for vehicles within 30 days of an event. The city plans to gather feedback from the community and will present a plan of action for the Raleigh Council June 18th. There's well, no secret too much salt in your diet can contribute to health problems. There's another one we can add to the list now, skin issues. New research from the University of San Francisco found high sodium diets can increase the risk of developing eczema. The research group discovered this by studying the diet of nearly 215,000 people who were between the ages of 30 and 70. We are now less than a week away from the U.S. Open at Pinehurst Resort and Country Club. Things are well underway. The USGA has put together quite an ensemble here as we take a look an interactive experience. It's intended to grow the game, honor its history. You see they moved the Payne Stewart statue there. A reminder, the merch tent is also open for anyone to visit until Sunday. After that, you will need a tournament ticket to enter. And we have that live look. We gave you at Pinehurst practice rounds starting Monday. We'll have a full team of reporters here in Pinehurst on the course all throughout the week. Look for our live reports there and they will take a day like this and just extend it, cut and paste four days for round play when it gets started next Thursday. Elizabeth Gardner is in the WRS Severe Weather Center right now. It's a little far off to be looking at what's going to happen there, but we can hope, right? Yes, yeah, so hoping that the weather is perfect. You know, it is June. This is the time of year that we frequently have afternoon and evening thunderstorms. And a lot of times they, you know, they come and go pretty quickly. So hopefully it wouldn't disrupt play too much if we do end up with any of those storms. Right now we're looking uh, pretty nice across the region. It is still going to be a fairly hot afternoon, but we're looking at blue sky there in Goldsboro. It's sunny in Apex, nice and clear here in Chapel Hill, courtesy of Top of the Hill Restaurant. And there in Fayetteville, some pretty sunshine on Hay Street right in 
in front of our newsroom. So what's uh, happening with the big picture? We've had our cold front slide toward the coast and eventually it's uh, moving off, but it's been fairly slow to move. High pressure building in behind it rotates clockwise. So that high is grabbing up some dry air from the north and west of us and pushing it into our region. I wish I could say that it was dropping our temperatures a lot, but it really isn't. It'll be slightly cooler than it was, say, yesterday when we were in the low 90s, but we're still looking at upper 80s. We're going to start to see a front developing here. You can see from Texas through parts of Oklahoma and uh, Kansas and up to the north, uh, a line of showers and storms developing. A front's going to uh, begin to develop there and push eastward. That could affect us on Sunday. We jump ahead and start talking about Sunday right around lunchtime or so. We'll see a mix of sun and clouds, and then we'll watch that front approaching. Tomorrow's going to be a nice, quiet day. We'll see plenty of sunshine and low humidity like we talked about earlier. But on Sunday, as early as 2 or 3 in the afternoon, there could be an isolated shower or thunderstorm. The front itself doesn't come through until the evening, perhaps not until 7, 8, 9 o'clock. And at that point, we might have a better chance of a few scattered storms. So it's something that we'll be watching closely. If you do have plans to be out and about on Sunday, it is going to be the hotter, more humid day of the weekend, high of 93. And we do have that chance of storms. So just keep checking in with us over the weekend uh, for any updates on the timeline of those storms on Sunday. In the meantime, yeah, it's going to be toasty on Saturday, 88 degrees, but our humidity remains low. And if you're a morning exercise kind of person or you just like to be out early on Saturday, maybe playing golf or fishing, um, it should feel really comfortable for us on Saturday morning. Of course, this is June, and by now we tend to be watching what's happening. The hurricane season begins June 1st. Nothing imminent uh, developing in the next four or five days, but into next week, we start to watch our tropical depression probability, and it does go up to 40 to 50 percent over around Mexico or maybe even just north of South America. Typically, we've already started to see some storms developing by this time of the season. Arlene developed in 2017 in April, so we go from 2017 every year to now, and we've even either seen storms developing April, May, or early June. Last year, we had Arlene develop on June the 2nd, so we've had named storms developing early in the season. So far, we have not seen any this year. We have not reached that A storm yet, and that is great news. A lot of the hurricane forecasters are forecasting a very active season, so um, we'll hope that maybe they're not exactly right this time. 89 on Friday today. That's our high today. 62 tomorrow morning, so with the low humidity and 62, it should feel comfortable in the morning. A couple of other comfortable mornings, Tuesday and Wednesday morning, will be in the low to mid 60s, but we could see a few stray storms Tuesday and Wednesday. And uh, Jeff, I know those golfers will be out to getting ready on those days, that's for sure. They certainly will be. Can't wait to see that. Elizabeth, thank you. You've heard of the musical Hello, Dolly. There's a new one now out called, or it's coming soon anyway. It's called Thanks Hello, I'm Dolly. It's all about the one and only Dolly Parton. What the legendary singer is revealing on stage in this new musical. Got a breaking news update within the past eight minutes here in the WRL Life Center regarding Poe Hall. We have learned that a letter was sent to the College of Education faculty by its dean in the last two and a half hours, essentially saying the university is considering, quote, significant changes to the building. Now, Monday, you may recall, NC State released the second round of PCB testing results done inside the building, and that is home to, the, again, the College of Education and Psychology Department. Now, faculty and staff of that department are being given the option to ask questions anonymously about this latest report, and if you have any more questions regarding this story, we have this broken down on our website, WRAL.com. Thanks for that, Chris. We wrap things up now with a look at a few of the headlines we've been following for you today. The search is on in Fayetteville for a suspect in a drive-by shooting that sent a child to the hospital. It happened just after midnight at a home on Danish Drive. A man who lives nearby tells us he saw a car slowly going down the street and then heard gunshots. We're trying to learn the exact age and condition of that child. For the first time ever, the women began play today at the soccer tournament at Wake Med Soccer Park. The U.S. women's team featuring former Tar Heel and NC Courage player Heather O'Reilly is playing right now against Streetball FC Canada. The teams are competing for a $1 million prize. Legendary game show host Pat Sajak is wrapping up his legendary career. Tonight, he'll sign off after more than four decades with Wheel of Fortune. The other half of the show's iconic pair shared an emotional farewell. What an incredible and unforgettable journey we've had. And I've enjoyed every minute of it. 
with you. That is just a small piece of the two minute farewell video from Vanna White. It was posted to the Wheel of Fortune YouTube page. White talks about sharing memories, milestones, and life events with Sajak. After tonight, Ryan Seacrest will host Wheel. Dolly Parton will share her life story on Broadway. The country music legend is developing a bio musical called Hello, I'm Dolly, chronicling her life and career. The score will feature new songs as well as her biggest hits. The show opens in 2026. Our pet of the day is from the SPCA of Wake County. It's a cat who lives up to her name, Queenie, an 11 year old short haired tabby who expects nothing less than the best. She's very independent and wants love on her terms. She also isn't afraid to let you know what she likes and doesn't like. Because of that, her ideal home would be a cat savvy family with no young kids and no other cats. For more information about Queenie, you can visit spcawake.org. Just seven weeks away from the opening ceremony of the Summer Olympic Games in Paris and ahead on our news at four. Jay Gray reports from the coast of Western France as the Olympic torch continues its historic journey across that country. You get breaking news up. Keep watching WRAL News over the air channel 34 and Spectrum channel 1257.